really grateful for your contribution. Our next speaker is Dr. Sonia Adesaro. Um, Sonia is a West London doctor and she's, people will know her as an activist. She's been specialising in campaigning around reproductive health, migrant, she's been campaigning on migrant rights, gender equality, and of course, she co-chairs the Young Medical Women International Association, sits on the Central Council of the Scott Socialist Health Association. People will know her as a, a Labour Party activist campaigner who's been, I think, the messaging that she's done around health in particular has been incredibly effective. Sonia, thanks for participating in this. Thank you for having me. Um, and it's been a really great afternoon so far. I find it really energising. So thank you to all the, all the other speakers in the event so far. Um, so I thought I would start by um, telling you about a night shift that I was working on um, just a few weeks actually before we all started talking about COVID. Um, I was working in A&E department um, and a young man, um, I think he was about 14, 13, 14 years old, who was brought into our resource department um, and he was having an asthma attack and um, I guess despite all of the efforts um, of the team, he, he he passed away, and it's you know, I guess death is something that's always quite difficult to handle. And um, I think it's one of those things that you never become immune to. But a death of a of a child, and you know, seeing the family, um, seeing his father cry at the death of his son was something that is I think you know continues to haunt me. Um, and we have the highest asthma death rates in Europe. Um, children being admitted to, into hospital with respiratory conditions has risen by 50%, 5 0 in the past decade. Um, and there are many factors behind this, um, particularly our polluted air, but also more and more children living in poor housing, um, living in poverty, living in um, having poor diets, malnutrition. Um, and we know that the admission rates for children with respiratory conditions is highest in the parts of our, in our, in our most deprived communities and areas of the country that are most deprived. Um, so I, I wanted to, to mention this because, you know, as COVID has shown, our health is very much a product of the world that we live in. It's a product of the economic system that we live in. And your health is very much dependent on whether you are a beneficiary or at the harsh end of that economic, the unjust economic system that we live in. Um, and this starts, you know, this starts from before you are born. So if a, if a pregnant woman, if she's living in, um, in deprivation or if she's experiencing significant amounts of um, stress or abuse, then we know from the research that her, her child will be at increased risk of being, of, being, of being stillborn or being born with sickness. And the impact of disadvantage on your health accumulates across your life course. Um, so we know that people living in the most deprived areas of this country, um, their lives are cut short by, by 10 years compared to those living in more wealthy areas. We also know, and again, COVID has clearly shown this, that your, that your health is very much dependent on the political ideology of those in power. Um, so as others have mentioned, the, um, the politics of austerity, the deliberate um, defunding of our public services has led to hundreds and thousands of deaths. Um, and the underfunding of our health service, the marketization of our, of our NHS has weakened our NHS ability to cope with COVID. Um, and as you know, as John mentioned, described so vividly, it, privatization of our NHS is behind our government's failure to get a grip on this crisis and, and has led to you know, an unmeasurable number of deaths. Um, and I'm not going to go over because I think John explained the privatization really, you know, really vividly, but the one point that I'd like to emphasize is that. You know, the covert privatization of our healthcare service has been happening, you know, has accelerated in recent years, but it's been happening for over 30 years. So it's happened under governments of all colours. Um, and alongside marketization of healthcare, we've seen um, the, the, the undermining of universalism, the erosion of the principle of healthcare as a human right. So we are now at a place in our country where if you are a migrant or simply if you look foreign, um, you can be denied healthcare. We've had pregnant women in recent years die because they've been too scared to see the doctor. We have children with cancer who have been denied healthcare because their parents can't afford the migrant healthcare charges. Um, and for me, what personally what I find um, so, I guess, so chilling about this is how healthcare professionals themselves have become complicit in this. Healthcare professionals have become uh, accepting 
of that rationale that there are some people who are just less worthy of healthcare, that some people, because of their visa, visa status, are just not worthy of that human right of healthcare. Um, and just finally, I think, you know, I want us to remember that before COVID hit, um, we were already facing multiple crises that were impacting the health of our communities. So we were already um, had a crisis of racial injustice where um, black or Asian infants born in our country were dying at two to three times the rate of, of, of white infants. We had the economic crisis where um, financial insecurity and just lack you know, of basic workplace rights has, has led to many people being more vulnerable to sickness and more vulnerable to death. And of course, the environmental crisis, which has already, um, but will continue to cause sickness um, and death and, and the loss of livelihoods and loss of, a loss of livings to millions of people, particularly in the global south, but across the world. So, you know, if we truly want to, um, to get to, to, to truly have health justice, if we truly want to create a society and create a world where everyone is able to be healthy and live healthy and fulfilling lives, we need to understand the interconnectedness of these injustices and these crises. We can't, you know, be acting in our silos. Um, and I also think, you know, we've got to, I guess, learn um, from the recent past that, you know, I don't think, I think if we're focusing purely on, on what's the happenings of parliament and legislative change, I don't, I think that'll be ineffective. That won't be enough to create the change that we need. We need to be, as others have mentioned, organizing in our communities, building campaigns, building a progressive movement, and only then will we be able to, to build um, the power to deliver the change that we need in our communities. Um, so to finish on that, um, if you'd like to get involved in campaigns, um, we, you know, Key Punches Public is campaigning against NHS privatisation. Um, at Docs Not Cops, we're campaigning against hostile environment in healthcare. And if you want to get, um, I didn't mention, but we can, if you have time, we can talk about the, the trade deal and global justice now and um, War and Want and Key Punch Public are working, are campaigning against the trade deal, which is being negotiated now, which, as John said, um, could accelerate the, and lock in the privatisation of our healthcare services. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Sonia, thanks ever so much. Thanks ever so much. You always, you always make the policy real by the real life examples that you give. Really grateful for all that you do as well. Thanks ever so much. Our next speaker is Sami 